Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Bob. I am alcoholic. It's good to be here. It's good to be at a what I would think of as a fundamentalist day weekend. In a, in a day and age where we are beset by a lot of weirdness, this is a good AA weekend. Uh, I think it's, it's amusing to me that I'm asked to talk on something that I was kind of opposed to when I got here, the 12 traditions. It was, I, had, I was like that guy in the treasure of Sierra Madre. Traditions, we don't need no stinking traditions. You know, I had that kind of attitude when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, something happened to me, and I fell in love with AA. First through some of the people, and then the group, and then just Alcoholics Anonymous itself. And it, as I did that and moved my caring from me out into you, the tradition started to become very important to me. And uh, what I'm going to try to talk about tonight is not, is not just a nuts and bolts academic talk about the traditions, but my personal experience with them, my failures. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, breaches of the traditions, and never by bad intention people. And my own breaches of them were just through ignorance and not through bad intention. Uh, I ran a corporation, which I sold last year, and we ran it on the 12 traditions. And all my management team and staff didn't know anything about the 12 traditions, but they could tell you about the principles because we talked about them in our staff meetings a lot. Um, you know, the, a little bit, a little history of... of I feel, always feel like when I do a talk of the history, it's so, I always feel like that guy on Rocky and Bullwinkle. Um, <laughs> improbable. But from what, what I've been able to ascertain, most of you know how Alcoholics Anonymous started. Bill, Dr. Bob met at the Cyberling Mansion Gatehouse, uh, Mother's Day, around Mother's Day, 1935. And Dr. Bob fell in love with uh, Bill and everything he said. He, uh, his son told me the story of come going with them and Bob digging his heels in and not wanting to talk to this Yankee who's going to tell him about his drinking. And Bob, uh, Bill never told Bob about Bob's drinking. Bill told Bob about Bill's drinking. And he was so enthralled he'd never hurt anybody that he could identify with before. And instead of, he, when he told them, when he went in there, he said, you got to get me out of here in 15 minutes. I think he stayed several hours and moved Bill into his house. And they sat around for for weeks and talked about spirituality and the principles. And Bob uh, rededicated himself to God and uh, did a little bit of house cleaning, was willing to do everything that Bill suggested except the amends. Wouldn't do the amends. He said, "Bill, you don't understand. I got a bad. I, my reputation's bad enough here. You know. You know. I, mean, I can't. I can't do that." And as a consequence of that, um, Doctor Bob went to a medical convention in Atlantic City and got drunk. Possibly as this, as a result of a lack of step eight and nine, maybe. And he uh, was so drunk coming back on the train, they laid him on the uh, platform. And in the first, one of the first great untreated Alanons, his nurse office person came running down to rescue him again, as she had many times, and, and brought him uh, back to the office. And they called uh, Bill and Ann, and they came over and took him home and put him to bed. And he woke up. What we think is. There's been some dispute about this lately, but what has seemed to be commonly, most commonly accepted, June 10th, 1935, and he woke up and he was shaken as we wake up from a drunk, shaken and 
jumping out of our skin in bad shape. And he said, what, what day is it? And he said, June 10th. And he says, oh, my God, not June 10th. I have a surgery to perform this morning. And Dr. Bob was a proctologist, so you can use your imagination of what kind of surgery that was. And, and he was going like this. You know, imagine being a patient, wait, laying on the operating table, watch your surgeon come in like that. Uh, we should, A, should erect a statue of that guy. We don't even know who he is. We, nobody's been able to find out who he is. Um, <laughs> Bill gave, Bill gave uh, Bob his last drinks in a goofball and sent him into the surgery. And uh, we don't know. I, I talked to a couple friends of mine that are historians and archivists and Bill P. and a couple other guys, and they... They've searched the Akron Hospital records trying to find out this guy's name, what happened to him. And we really don't know. All that we know is that he lived. Like it's, it's endorsement or affiliation, actual or implied. And somebody from another group came and they gave us hell one night. They said, you're, you know, you're implying affiliation with Catholic charities. And we never meant no harm. You see, as individual members, we could have done the exact same thing if we wouldn't have done it in the name of Alcoholics Anonymous group, we could have done it. And so we still do the same thing every year. We just don't do it as a, we don't do it behind the group name because it, it, it implies affiliation. And I know it's, it sounds like a stretch, but in it, I don't think, we, I think when it comes to the traditions, I would always, in the, in, in the spirit of unity, and not to be a source of contention, I think we should always err on the side of prudence. I would hate to see some new, some new guy that say he's pissed off at the Catholic Church storm out of AA because we're we're doing something that to him thinks like he thinks we're helping the Catholic Church, right? And I tell you, we there was not a bad-hearted person in that group that decided to do that. We just it was not done out of malice; it was done out of ig- ignorance, I guess. Tradition number seven. Every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. This is really where we have our our integrity. And I'll tell you, Alcoholics Anonymous is the only organization, I think, in the world that turns down money. As a matter of fact, on a regular basis, people will die and maybe AA helped their son or their daughter or their wife or their husband, and they'll try to leave a million dollars to Alcoholics Anonymous. And the AA General Service Office will have to hire attorneys not to take the money. People in the regular world think that's crazy. They think that is the most bizarre thing. You are paying an attorney not to take money. Is that right? Well, yeah. (laughs) We won't take it. We will not take money from outside sources. As a matter of fact, there's a limit to what an individual member can contribute in a year. Two thousand. Yeah, I remember. I remember when it was two hundred. <laughs> yes, it was. It's two thousand. Well, that's inflation. You know what? And what we try to do, and in, in this this spirit of self-supporting, is is very important. It is my. My voice that I'm happy for my sobriety and I'm grateful to AA that I put some money in the basket. And I'll t- I'm ashamed to tell you this, but I came here, I was a taker for a long time. I'm the guy who came to a meeting, drank four cups of coffee, and put 50 cents in the basket. That's a taker. Where You know a restaurant, you can get four cups of coffee for 50 cents? And then later, when I, my sponsor beat me up, I started drinking five cups of coffee and putting in a dollar. Right? I'm drinking five dollars worth of coffee and putting in a dollar. You know what I do at my home group? I put I never put less than a five dollar bill in. I, I put in what today would be the cost of one drink. And I tell you a lot of, unless you're down on Skid Row, a drink today is about five bucks. And there there are guys that I know guys in AA that have been putting a dollar in the basket for thirty years. For 30 years. You know what a dollar was worth 30 years ago compared to what it's worth today? Nothing. It was appropriate 30 years ago. Now that's not, if you're, if you're really poor and you don't have any money, you don't have to put anything in there. But I tell you, if you just, if you got the money, put it in. It is my statement 
of my gratitude in Alcoholics Anonymous that I, I like what goes on here. I don't want to be a taker here. I want to be a giver. I want to be a contributing member of Alcoholics Anonymous. God knows I've been a taker a lot of my life. And, I, you know, this, self, this principle of self-supporting, my first sponsor, I, I tell you, he hammered that. If there was, in addition to getting you to work the steps and go to meetings, it was get a job. You know, that was a big thing. Get a job. And when I was about a year sober, I got laid off, and I had an opportunity to collect unemployment and get $120 a week, free, free and clear for doing nothing. My sponsor made me, I got, somebody offered me a job where I was going to take home $96 and change a week. He made me give up the 120 and take the 96 I thought, you don't do math or what? I mean, <laughs> but he knew something that I didn't know, that my integrity as an individual, that I had to pull, I had to pull my own weight here. But I, I just can't take money. If I can go work, I go work. I got guys I sponsor that get sober and they've, they've manipulated the system and they got free money coming from all, you know, the social, all kinds of stuff. And yet, yet they could work. One of the first things I tell them is to become self-supporting. And they go crazy on you. You want me to give up free money? Yeah. Be self-supporting through your own through your own contributions. Have you ever gotten anything that you didn't deserve that you could hold on to that did you any good? You know that you ever felt good about? I never did. And tradition number eight is one of the traditions where we took a big hit. Also, it says Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. That's the short form. Now check out the long form. It's really, it goes into a lot, a lot more detail. Tradition 8, the long form, Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional. We define professionalism as the occupation of counseling alcoholics for fees or higher. But we may employ alcoholics where they are going to perform those services for which we might otherwise have to engage non-alcoholics. And our, our central office employs a custodial guide, an office manager. He does clerical work, but he doesn't get paid for 12-step work. It gets paid for clerical work. And they could have hired somebody a temp from an agency, but they hired a guy in aid. That's perfectly all right. Such special services may be well recompensed, but our usual AA 12-step work is never, never to be paid for. Isn't that funny that it says it that, that way? And yet, I, you know what the first, when I got sober, you know what the, the first job I, that occurred to me I'd like to do? Uh, but I understand they're wanting to find out. You know, we'd like to know. I mean, did the guy whistle when he walked or what? I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, we don't know. We know he lived. Uh, and Bob uh, got out of that surgery the end, in the morning and disappeared for the whole day. And uh, Bill and Ann were afraid he drank again, as I would be. If I'd given a guy a couple beers in the morning, with what I know about the phenomenon of craving, it would be uh, easy to think that the guy's on a run. But he wasn't on a run. He got out of that surgery and spent the rest of that morning and all that afternoon, early evening, searching out everybody over owed amends to. And he never drank again. And Alcoholics Anonymous was formed, and it grew very, very slowly. By uh, 1939, they had less than 80 people in four years. Uh, but a couple things started happening to Alcoholics Anonymous, and one of the things was the publishing of the big book. And with that, our membership grew some. And then there was a Liberty uh, Magazine article that gave us some more exposure, and we grew some more. And then there was the uh, Cleveland Plain Dealer interview with Raleigh, uh, the baseball player, and that brought a lot of people to the table in the Cleveland group of Alcoholics Anonymous. They were inundated by a lot of people. And then 
Finally, the Jack Alexander article in the Saturday Evening Post, which probably brought more people into AA than any publication. And uh, I think one of the reasons that was so effective is Jack Alexander had a tremendous reputation for being a no-nonsense troubleshooter, a guy that could not be bought off or persuaded. He was a guy that had, had, had gone into investigated this one religion, this one church, and found a lot of corruption in there and a lot of crap going on. He went into the unions in Philadelphia and and covered the corruption down there. He was a real go in behind the scenes, find out what the real dope is and and tell people about it. And he had that reputation. And when Alcoholics Anonymous started to get a lot of notoriety, uh, he assumed, as I'm sure I probably would if I would have been in his business, ah, there's something going on here. This can't be. They can't be what they say they are. It's just, it's nobody's like that. And he went in and investigated us. And I think, I imagine, to his delight and amazement, we were exactly what we said we were. Nobody here was trying to, had an axe to grind. Nobody was trying to make money off of this thing. And, and as a result of that, Alcoholics Anonymous the, just was overwhelmed with requests for help. I was, uh, I knew a gal, uh, named Sybil, who was one of the first uh, women to ever get sober on the West Coast. And if you've ever heard ever heard her talk, she came to Alcoholics Anonymous and she wasn't even done, sh- right around that time, and she wasn't even done shaken yet. And the Los Angeles group had so many requests for help from women that she's still vibrating and they're sent, giving her a stack of letters and sending her out on 12-step calls. Uh, that we were just overwhelmed. And uh, there was no traditions. And with growing pains come problems. And Alcoholics Anonymous started to incur a lot of problems and a lot of disunity. Uh, People were getting resentments and getting drunk. The group in Akron, except for Dr. Bob, that affiliated themselves with the group in Cleveland, and they thought the that Bill Wilson and the people in New York were the spawn of Satan or, you know, they didn't like those people. And the people in New York thought the people in Akron were, you know, too backward. And there was a lot of bickering going on. And and there was a group down in a guy down in Florida that was charging for membership to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, (laughs) There was a woman I have. I didn't I don't have the letter with me, but I have a copy of it, a, a letter that was just dated December. Uh, beginning of December 1941, and it was written from the executive committee of Alcoholics Anonymous of the Los Angeles group. And there was one of the guys on there. I knew him, and a guy who's named Al Marino, he signed it. And he was among several signatures on that uh, letter. And the letter was addressed to a a gal who came to AA, and uh, her name was Irma Livoni. And Irma uh, was a... uh, liked a lot of the gals in my home group. She liked men. I mean, a lot. And uh, she liked all kinds of men. She was very flirtatious. She didn't care if they were married or single. She didn't care. She just liked men. And and so they wrote her this letter, the executive committee, revoking her membership in Alcoholics Anonymous. (laughs) Which is kind of sad, really. I mean, if if the traditions had to come along and stuff like that would have stuck... I'll tell you, I know a lot of people in AA that have been helped by less than virtuous women. I, <laughs> so, you know, I, some of, as a matter of fact, some of the most stellar members of my home group when it comes to carrying the message into hospitals and institutions are, are gals that maybe at some time or, their, or other in their life have, would have been like Irma. And they would have revoked her, their memberships. And maybe people would have died of alcoholism as a result of them not being there for them. Uh, there's all this disunity going on and Bill is is getting inundated by letters from all over the country people scared all this bickering and fighting and judgments that are going on and uh, a guy from uh, North Carolina wrote him a letter saying you know this is a lot like what happened to the Washingtonians and Bill uh, Bill didn't even know about the Washingtonians founder of Alcoholics Anonymous and he but he was very astute, and he did some research, and he found out that in the mid, 
1800s, a couple drunkards had met in a bar in Baltimore. And these were, these were bottom-of-the-barrel guys. These were guys that had tried many temperance pledges. They'd been to the churches and doctors. And they'd done everything. They swore and promised to their families they would never drink that stuff. And they kept drinking again. And they, and they didn't know what was wrong with them. And they're sitting in this bar, and they're talking about all the people that have tried to help them. And they came, they said to each other, you know, they don't understand us. And everybody, they all said, yeah, they really don't. They're well-meaning people, but they don't really get what drives us, what's wrong with us. He said, and the one guy said, but I think I understand what drives you, because it's the same thing that drives me. And the other guy says, yeah, that's right. And they came up with a novel idea. The novel idea is maybe we can help each other. What all these men of religion and science and medicine can't do for us what our families who love us dearly can't do for us, maybe we can do for ourselves. And they started this little fellowship of uh, failed drunkards, and they started staying, staying sober. And within just a few years, without telephone, without mass transit, without everything that we have in place and was in place in the 1930s when Alcoholics Anonymous was formed, this couple of guys in a bar in Baltimore grew a fellowship called the Washingtonians that within just a few years, not even a, just less than a decade, the high estimates were a half million people. The low estimates were one to 200,000. Matter of fact, if you go through a book of... Uh, Abraham Lincoln's speeches prior to his pre becoming president, he had an address to a huge convention of Washingtonians as a senator from Illinois. And the Washingtonians, just, they, were, they, were, they were incredible. They had big conventions around the country and they had speakers. But something started happening to them. They started bickering among themselves. And they started, you know, this group, you know, they don't... No, that group over there, they don't really say it right. And, you know, we're the ones that say it right. And, you know, they all, you know, that you ever hear that stuff, right? That little bickering stuff going on. And they, then they started to branch out and get involved in, in other things, things that would, I'm sure, easily make sense to them, like the abolition of slavery. I mean, if you're trying to stay sober and clean up your act and live a spiritual way of life, that would make perfect sense. Slavery is an abomination. You'd say, yeah, that's wrong. We should get behind that. And they got behind that. They got behind the temperance movement and, and aligned themselves with the temperance movement because to them it made sense. You know, alcohol almost killed us. We should stop alcohol the production and sale of it. We'll, we'll back that. They got involved in that. They got involved with trying to help laudanum addicts. And laudanum uh, addiction was a pretty prevalent thing back in the 1800s. It was a patent medicine that you could buy over the counter that was a, had a tremendous concentration of opium in it. And they got behind that. They got behind the war of Mexico and a whole bunch of other stuff. And within less than a decade, they grew to great ranks and then ceased to exist. And as far as we know, most of the alcoholics who had a shot who had been sober for a couple years in the Washingtonians, ended up dying of alcoholism when the Washingtonians dissolved. And Bill Wilson uh, is reading about that, and he's going, my God, this is exactly what's happening to us. And Bill uh, became afraid, as I would become afraid. What, what would happen to us if AA didn't exist? What would have happened to me in 1978 as I came to the last time and right before coming into AA, if I, I stood on a bridge and tried to take my own life? What would have happened to me if there wasn't any AA? I'd have been dead. I'm telling you. And that's not dramatic podium talk. I would have been dead. I would have never made 1980. And what would happen to my children's 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 children if they develop alcoholism? And they find themselves in the trap they can't spring. A seeming inability to stay away from the thing that's killing you. And once you start doing it, you can't control it. And it always destroys you. So I've come over the years to value the traditions. Uh, I know that 
without the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and the process that's outlined in the big book, I will die of alcoholism. But without the traditions, we will all die of alcoholism. And I love AA. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to, I'm going to go through the traditions, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the long form and the short form. And how, the, the way they evolved, you know, or Bill, as a result of this Washingtonian deal and everything, he wrote the long form, which was, it wasn't called the long form because it was, there wasn't a short form to compare it to. It was just that, as a matter of fact, I have a copy of uh, uh, an old copy at home where they're called, they weren't even called the traditions, they were called the tenants to ensure AA's future. And he uh, wrote them in the long form, is, is what we call the long form. He tried to present them to the groups, tried to get the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous to adopt them. And we would have nothing to do with it. And my home group reads the long form once a month. And if you've ever been in a meeting where they read the long form, they're long. I mean, they're really, really long. I mean, it takes 10 minutes. And, uh, you know, alcoholics, and we... I know this is hard to believe. We have a tendency to be a little bit self-involved, a little self-centered. And, and, and people were pissed because they were going, wait, that's cutting into time. We can be talking about me here. I don't need no rules. I want to talk about me. So they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't adopt him. They wouldn't, they wouldn't even read him. As a matter of fact, Bill Wilson, who at the time was probably one of the most sought-after speakers in Alcoholics Anonymous, groups were asking him to speak and then making him promise not to mention the traditions or you, we don't want you. I mean, there's letters in our archives that talk about these groups sending Bill le you know, letters. We want you, want you to come and talk, but you've got to promise you won't talk about those traditions. Wow. So Bill is, is frustrated because he believes in his heart that these are absolutely necessary. And the pressure is on him, and there's some people. Uh, I talked to a guy named Bob Bob P, who was the he, was, he ran the New York office probably the longest term from the early '60s up to the mid '80s. And and Bob, I was talking to him, and Bob told me that he believed that the 12, the short form of the twelve traditions was not written by Bill. He says he believed that Bill contributed to them, but they were actually put together it was a collaboration of Bill. And uh, one of the guys who was with the, the newly, newly formed Grapevine staff. But regardless, uh, the short form was brought about after a failure to get the groups to accept the long form. Built back to the short form. They were, it was printed in a series of articles in the Grapevine. And eventually in 1950, and this was in the late 40s, and then in 1950 at the first International Conference of Alcoholics Anonymous in Cleveland, they were presented to the fellowship and were adopted uh, kind of a, in a railroad situation after they were presented. Bill said, does anybody disagree with those? Good. Okay, they're passed. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. It was, it was sort of pushed them through. And I'll tell you, this is my own feeling and my own sense, but I think we took a big hit when we went from the long form to the short form. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this, the basic differences between the, some of the traditions in the long form and short form and how they've affected us. And I want to talk a little bit also about how uh, personally the traditions, I've tried to make them a part of my life. I think that the spiritual principles in the 12 traditions are often more difficult to apply in my life personally than the steps because they involve my interaction with people. And you ever noticed how sometimes people don't do it right? <laughs> Just like the 12 steps in the first tradition, the problem is defined. In, the, in step one, the problem for, is defined. Powerlessness over alcohol and an inability to manage your own life, drunk or sober. And the problem in the first tradition is the problem that the spiritual principles of the 12 traditions address. A lack of unity. It says for our common welfare, our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon a unity. When the traditions were put into place, Alcoholics Anonymous was suffering from a lack of unity. If Alcoholics Anonymous ever dissolves, 
it will become from a la- it'll come from a lack of unity. And on a personal level, a, a part of my alcoholism is really a lack of unity. Carl Jung, in a letter he wrote to Bill Wilson, I have a copy of it here. There's a little passage in here. He says, he talks about Roland Hazard, and he says, his craving for alcohol was the equivalent on a low level of the spiritual thirst of our being for wholeness, expressed in medieval language, the union with God. I, I suffered from a lack of unity, and I drank to overcome that often. I, do you remember the feeling of walking into a bar and you're so locked up inside yourself and you can't fit? And it, God, it feels like you're dying of loneliness. And you're surrounded by people that are having fun that want, to, want you to be a part of. But it feels almost as if there's some sort of invisible barrier between me and those people that I can't break through or surmount. And the loneliness is very desolate and painful. And five shots of Jack Daniels and the barrier would come down and I could come out and play and be a part of and about seven shots. And I just love these people. You know, remember that feeling? Remember remember that feeling in the old days when alcohol really worked and it could connect me to people to, to such a level of being a part of an intimacy would almost bring tears to my eyes. And then I would sober up and go back to being me all alone in that state of anxious apartness. Lack of unity was a big problem for me, and I drank to overcome it. And the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous are designed to protect me from my natural inclination to separate myself. And I think the ism often in my, expresses itself in my life as I separate myself. And if I am ever to leave Alcoholics Anonymous, it will be because of that. I believe if I ever drink again, you know, and I leave A, you know what will happen is I will leave one judgment at a time. I will leave my home group one judgment at a time. And the problem, I watch guys do this, and I have caught myself doing it. I don't think I'm leaving. I think they're screwed up. Right? Hideous. If you think like that, God help you. <laughs> that's that's a big, one of my biggest handicaps, that thing that wants to separate me from you. Tradition number two. And this, for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. That was the long form. And this is the only tradition that's longer in the short form than it is in the long form, which, which makes the short, makes this very alcoholic. I mean, this is, that's just, there's a rightness about that somehow in AA. I don't know. I haven't figured it out, but it's longer in the short form. And the, the add on is our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. This concept of, of a God who expresses himself through our group conscience is a tremendous thing to watch. I've watched it on the group level at my home group's business meetings. I've watched it as an area officer and a DCM and GSR in the area assemblies for years. And I would watch this, the hand of God work through this group conscience. And it's a funny thing to watch. Because the elements that make it take shape are often very bizarre. You'll have a subject on the floor of an assembly or maybe in your home group that has to be decided. And you will have people sharing stuff at this problem from the left field and from the right field. And then I would see it right in the middle of a heated discussion. Some guy get up to the mic, hog the microphone for 10 minutes and tell his story. (laughs) Right? I mean, you'll see all of it. But it's all, all fingers on the hand of God. It's all elements in that. And then out of that just comes this thing that materializes, which is a group conscience. And the group conscience, if it's an informed group conscience and it's a group conscience that that has been followed the the concepts and the traditions and used the minority voice, etc., is almost always right. I've watched, I've gone to assemblies where my group wanted me to vote a certain way. And I would vote that way. 
even though I had to write a decision, I'd vote that way because I believed them. And then the assembly would go a completely other direction, and I knew they were wrong, wanted to explain it to them. They wouldn't listen. <laughs> and a year later, I realized they were right. But you had to see you had to see the results of the decision to get it. That they that what they that the hand of God in that decision was right there. It was right there. And this add on that uh, <laughs> this is you know what it talks about it's our the group God is our ultimate authority. You know that makes newcomers crazy because you new guys come here and they want to talk to who's in charge. Oh, good. Have you, did, did you get on your knees? <laughs> no, no. I want to see who's in charge of A. I want to see the guy in charge. I want to go right to the top. Well, good. Yeah, God. Well, and Alcoholics Anonymous, this, this thing about our trusted servants, our, our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. That's a fun, this is a funny fellowship. It's the only place you'll ever see where you come in a big shot and work your way up to servant. <laughs> Right? As a matter as a matter of fact, the highest you can get in Alcoholics Anonymous is a state of a self abandonment and service. That's if you can get there and stay there, you're you're in good shape. You're the guy that glows in the meeting. You're the guy that every you're the guy. Uh, and that's what we aspire to. We come in we come in big shots. And and it, and that's there's a, a spiritual rightness about that. That I am trying to not be a, not govern, not rule, not anything. I'm trying to be a servant here. I'm trying to be helpful. One of my favorite pieces of old literature is Milton's Paradise Lost. And there's a passage in there where Lucifer has cast himself out of heaven through his own self will, and he shakes his fist at God and the angels in heaven. He says, I would rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. And you know something that's always been true for me? When I'm raining, it feels like hell. <laughs> and when I'm serving, it feels like heaven. I don't know what it is about me when I'm trying to run my life, and I have done that on many occasions sober, that it's just, it, it doesn't feel good to me. I'm in conflict. I'm arguing with life itself. And when I give up and just try to be helpful, and who can I help? Things I tell you, I've, I never feel better than when I'm doing that. When I'm down in Skid Row at the detox, or when I'm just I'm packing chairs for my home group, or setting, or giving some new guy a ride, without any ulterior motive. I tell you that I would rather I, I would rather have the, that feeling the rest of my life than the feeling I get when I'm running the show. So I hate that. Tradition number three, and I want to talk about the long form in this a little bit, the difference between the long form. I think this is one of the traditions where we took a hit, in my view. In the short form, it says the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. Everybody knows that. They say that at almost every meeting. But in the long form, as it was originally written, the membership requirement was much different. It says in the long form, our membership ought to include all who suffer from alcoholism. I'll tell you something. There's a big difference between having a desire not to drink and suffering from alcoholism. Everybody on the Atkins diet has a desire not to drink. They don't want the carbohydrates. Uh, Everybody, everybody that goes out one night with a bunch of friends and gets a little out of line and gets a DUI and is sent to a judge gets a desire not to drink. It doesn't mean that they have alcoholism. On page 20 and 21 of the big book, it talks about three different types of drinkers. It talks about the moderate drinker, the guy who can take it or leave it alone. Very few of them ever get here. Uh, occasionally a, an, inter, an overly obsessed, interested al is that's really a moderate drinker will slip into AA for a while. But it, it, it's usually, usually the, very few moderate drinkers get here. But then it talks about two other types of drinkers. A hard problem drinker. The book says a hard drinker. And this guy, by description, and I have known and drank with people like this, looks like an alcoholic. A doctor talking to this guy would diagnose him as alcoholic. It says he's, he drinks habitually. It says he may have the habit badly enough to gradually impair him mentally and physically. 
it says he may die a few years before his time. This is bad stuff. Habitual drinker who's screwing himself up mentally and physically and shortening his life as a result of his alcohol abuse. If if you were to look at alcoholism and say to yourself, well, maybe like uh, some diseases, maybe there's chronic alcoholism and acute alcoholism, this guy would be the acute alcoholic, just like pneumonia. Pneumonia is an acute condition. It could kill you, but once you got the antibiotics and you knock the pneumonia out, you no longer have pneumonia and you don't have to do any kind of maintenance or nothing. And then there's chronic illnesses like diabetes and some heart disease that you have to do stuff the rest of your life in order to live with that. So this hard problem drinker is almost like acute alcoholism. He, his, his problem really quits when the bottle ends because it says that this guy, if a sufficiently strong reason, ill health, warning from a doctor, falling in love, he has the ability to put the plug in the jug. He may need a little social support. So, so AA to the problem drinkers like the sober elks, it's kind of replaces the social void, you know, that you, that you used to get going to the bars. But when he stops drinking, he does not suffer from alcoholism. He does not go experience everything it talks about in the big book. He does not become restless, irritable, and discontent. He's not the guy it talks about on page 52 where, where a problem with personal relationships, prey to misery and depression, a feeling of uselessness, full of fear. Unha- He's none of that. He's just a guy who used to have a drinking problem. The Nancy Reagan Just Say No program of recovery works for that guy. <laughs> But it doesn't work for the next type of alcoholic it talks about on page 21. The real alcoholic. See, I'm the guy that by definition, I can't. I can't. There, there is no sufficient substitute. You can. I'm the guy who, when, when facing two years in a state penitentiary and all I had to do was not drink, I couldn't do it. I'm the guy that no matter what's at stake, there is no sufficient reason for me. The strongest reason on earth to not drink just makes it a little bit longer before I drink again. That's all. It just makes the fuse a little longer. But an alcoholic of my type with chronic alcoholism, it's not a matter of, of, of will I drink. It's a matter of when with untreated alcoholism. It's a matter of when. Ten years? Five years? Three years? I don't know. Without the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and God's grace, it's an inevitability for a guy like me. Because I got the thirst. I got the thirst in my spirit. So what has happened as a result of adopting, we as a fellowship now have adopted the long form I mean, I've walked away from the long form and adopted the short form. And I, it is what it is, but I'll tell you, it has opened the doors to Alcoholics Anonymous for a lot of our membership to be problem hard drinkers that don't have to work the steps. I, I know a lot of guys, sober 20 years, have, with the benefit of step none. And they stay sober on two things, putting the plug in the jug, attending a meeting once a week to remind themselves that they shouldn't drink. They don't, they don't suffer from alcoholism. They do not have the spiritual malady of alcoholism that I suffer from when I quit drinking. I'm an everyday member of Alcoholics Anonymous because I suffer from the disease of alcoholism. Without certain things in, my, in place in my life, I start to get sick. And often, when I start to get sick, I don't know that I'm getting sick. What it looks like is that you are, and I better tell you about it. <laughs> and I become restless, irritable, discontent, prone to depressions, deep depressions. Full of anxiety to the point almost of, of being over, almost of being debilitated by it. I'm that guy. I'm the guy that talks about it in the book. I suffer from alcoholism. And the book goes in the third tradition of long form goes on to say, Hence we may refuse none who wish to recover. Recover from from drinking too much? I think it's recover from alcoholism. 
I am, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous because I have a daily reprieve and I wish daily to recover from this disease. Because as an alcoholic, I go one of two ways. I'm going to go, I'm going to go further in towards God, closer to God and you, or I'm going to go further from you and God and closer to a drink. I don't think there's a choice. I either go one way or the other. I've never been one that's been able to just rest on my laurels without going, without getting weird. Or without you getting weird. <laughs> <laughs> Nor ought AA membership ever depend upon money or conformity. That's very important. Uh, we, you are welcome here no matter what. You're welcome here if you're a cross-dresser. You're welcome here if you're a Drug addict also, as long as you have alcoholism, as long as you're trying to recover from alcohol. In my home group, we have, we have representation from every aspect of human society. Everything you can think of. We've got Muslims, we got, we got everything you can think of in our group. Heterosexuals, bisexuals, trisexuals, uh, quatrosexuals. I don't know what that is, but the guy told me he said he would do anything at any time with anyone for a quarter. I don't. <laughs> um, and you don't have to shape up to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. You don't have to be like the other guys. You be who you, you bring. You play whatever hand you're dealt. You bring it to the table here. We refuse none who want to recover. Any two or three alcoholics gathered together for sobriety may call themselves an A group, provided that as a group they have no other affiliation. That's, my, that's why I'm a member of AA. Tradition number four, each group should be autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. This is the tradition that really gives us a lot of freedom in Alcoholics Anonymous. Freedom to to conduct our own affairs as a group, that any time a bunch of us get together and form an AA group, as long as we form for the purpose of recovery from alcoholism, we can go about that just about any way. As, as long as we don't imply or, uh, or an endorsement or affiliation to anything else. And in the long form, uh, it, it gets a little more, it gets into a little more detail. It says, with respect to its own affairs, each AA group should be responsible to no other authority than its own conscience. But when its plans concern the welfare of neighboring groups also, those groups ought to be consulted, and no group, regional committee, or individual should ever take any action that might greatly affect AA as a whole without conferring with the trustees of the General Service Board. On such issues, our common welfare is paramount. There's there's some areas that are kind of gray that I that I'll just tell you some th thoughts that have gone through my mind, and I don't know what's right or wrong in some of these areas. There's a group in Las Vegas that's an 11 step group, and they use particular they use literature and only literature from a, from a certain religion from an outside deal now the question always pops into my mind I don't know if that's right or wrong I think an 11 step group is a good idea but is that does that give a representation to the newcomer that we're kind of hooked up with this thing over here that's the thing that I wonder about um, I haven't wondered enough to write a letter to the conference about it, but I've wondered about it. Um, tradition number five. Each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. i tell you something I've observed. Uh, my old home group that I, I left uh, four and a half years ago to form the group that I'm a member of today, the specific group that I'm very proud to be a member of, uh, was a group that started to become very self-grandizing. It was a group of guys that were very close to each other and they were good old boys and we laughed a lot. And somehow along the line, the primary purpose in that group shifted from helping the new people to us. And I watched that happen and I watched that group deteriorate over the years because it was not fulfilling its primary purpose. 
And I think if a group does not fulfill its primary purpose or actively take action in that area of trying to help other alcoholics and reach out and do 12-step work, I think it eventually will wither and die. And I'll tell you something else. I think as an individual who suffers from alcoholism, if I get away from my primary purpose, I will wither spiritually and begin to die. And I know that because I experienced it when I was about 19 years sober. Um, when I was about 19 years sober, I sunk into a, a deep depression. The kind of depression where I didn't want to go out of the house. I would I had to make myself go to meetings and make myself go into my office. And, and I just... It was that depression where you just get so self-involved, right? And I don't know what's wrong with me. And my sponsor, all his, he has one answer to any problem, and it always has to do with the steps and turning up the volume. He doesn't want to hear anything about, you know, you know I'm trying to say, well, maybe I should go to a doctor. And no, no, we're going we're to turn the volume up on your program and see what happens. And I went to this meeting. And I came. I, I just. I just came back from a vacation. I, I'm throwing stuff at the abyss. In the six. In a six month period, I bought. I bought two. I, now I got three cars. I got a Jaguar, brand new Jaguar R. I got a brand new Corvette. I got a new BMW 740iL. I got two Harley Davidsons, and I and I look at this big house, and I'm just I'm buying stuff at the at the vacancy, right? Trying to fill it up. I just came back from Maui. I don't know why I'm depressed because I have everything I would ever want, and I have I'm not I owe no money. I don't I have more money in the bank than I could spend in a lifetime, and I'm dying, and I'm dying. I'm 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 so bad. I'm thinking about taking something. How bad do you have to feel in order to, to risk that? I mean, that's you have to be pretty, you know, for a guy like me. I don't know what's wrong with me. And I go to a meeting, and I uh, there's a guy that I run around with, and I'm telling him about this, and he said, he, he hit me. He said, uh, he said, Bob. He says, you know, your primary purpose used to be helping other drunks. He says, I don't. He says, I don't see that anymore. He said, you still go to a lot of meetings and sponsor a lot of people and run your mouth a lot. He says, but I think your primary purpose is you. And your gratification and your toys and your well-being and your sex life. I think your primary purpose is you, Bob. And he, I'll tell you, he could have hit me with a two-by-four. You know how you, when you hear the truth, you don't like it sometimes. <laughs> and I didn't like hearing that. But it was true. And I don't know how that happened. I was the guy that for 15 years or better in my sobriety, I existed to try to help drunks. I went on 12-step calls all the time. Two or three hospital institution commi com uh, commitments a week. And when he said that to me, it snapped me. And I, I tell you something, I started turning up the volume of my... My 12-step work, within a week, I got newcomers in my car from the halfway house, taking them to meetings and going out to coffee. And I tell you, I've never felt like that again. And I have, I have five commitments during the week in Las Vegas, three of them in institutions. I do a lot of 12-step work. I answer the phones for our central office a couple times a month. I sponsor a lot of guys. I'm back to... You know, in that period, I, used to, I started farming out fifth steps of guys I sponsor to other guys I sponsor. I know, I know, I'm sorry. I'm ashamed of that. I really am ashamed of that, too. You know, it was too big, you know. It was, well, it was interrupting the time that I needed to think about me. I mean, <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that pathetic? As, as, that's just, it's so pathetic. I mean, it's embarrassing for me to admit that. Because God saved me from an alcoholic death. I was the guy that lived on the streets, a homeless guy who tried to take his own life. And 18, 19 years later, I think God saved me, so I'll be wonderful. <laughs> right? He saved me for a purpose. I have a purpose. My purpose is divinely crafted, and that's to help other people who suffer like me. And if, if that's true, 
then, my God, everything I've ever gone through in my whole life, drunk or sober, has usefulness and meaning. If it's all about me, it means nothing. All the mistakes I've made are not useful if it's all about me. But if it's about helping you, then all of that stuff is useful. And I'll tell you, some of the greatest uh, things I have in, in helping other people have been my mistakes. The things I've done wrong and what I've reaped by those mistakes. That's my primary purpose. Tradition six. An AA group ought never endorse. Wait, I, I gotta, I gotta tell you something. I want to go back to this tr- primary purpose thing just for one second. We had a rash of suicides, double-digit sobriety suicides in Las Vegas for a period of about four years, and people were going south on us right and left. And I. Guys, 31 and a half years. Guys, 23 and a half years. Guys, a gal, 17 years. Another guy, 15 years. Another guy, 9 years. And I, I'm watching this. This is happening around the time that I'm getting screwed up when I was 19 years sober. And I'll tell you what I observed. In every case, by the time the guy took his own life, whether he put the plastic bag around his neck or over his head, or put the pistol to his head, or took the drug overdose, or whatever they killed themselves with. By the time they killed themselves, they had everything they would ever want in their life. My friend Frank, who came off a of skid row, he's a homeless guy. Everything he owned was in a paper sack, an extra pair of socks, extra pair of underwear, and that was it. By the time he took his own life at 23 and a half years sober, he had a big house, a beautiful wife, a lot of respect, a great business, making lots of money. Custom Harley Davidson, a restored old 1950s something Corvette. Beautiful custom truck, one of the most beautiful paint jobs I'd ever seen. If Frank would have made a checklist when he got sober of everything he would like to have in place in his life one day to be happy and satisfied, I'm telling you, by the time he took his own life, he would have fulfilled the list. Isn't that weird? Same thing with my friend Mike. Same thing with Tim. All, all these people. They did not die because they lost everything. They, 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 they died in the middle of great abundance. Great abundance. Isn't that weird? Wouldn't you think, as I, I, I wrestled with this in my mind, and then when I, I got into my deal, it all made sense to me. You'd think that that the abundance would at least make them a little less blue when they're depressed. But I tell you, it doesn't do that. It makes it worse. When I was a homeless guy, and I was living in this abandoned building, and I was dirty from laying on the ground, and I looked awful, and I felt awful, and my surroundings looked awful, I'm telling you, there was a continuity between my insides and my outsides. There was a funny kind of rightness about that. I feel like crap. I look like crap. My surroundings are crap. It's all crap. Well, there's a rightness about that. You get a guy like me suffering from the spiritual malady of alcoholism right in my heart. And you get me in a, with a backdrop of abundance and richness. The abundance does not make the whole smaller. It makes it stand out in starker and more painful relief. Because a, you cannot fix an inside spiritual problem with outside stuff. The outside stuff doesn't even help. And sometimes if you leave this unchecked, the outside stuff just makes it worse. It buys you time. With, through excitement. But eventually, you get to the place where Chuck used to talk about where you can no longer put anything between you and you. And I, and when I was 19 years sober, I sat in my house in a deep depression. I, there was no, nothing else I could buy or put between me and me. And I stopped, I stopped, the, I, I stopped centering myself on others and started centering myself on myself. You know, the depression that you get when you're just so self-involved, you just get your life and your emotions right here. And the more you look at your life, the more vacant. It's, you don't see that. It's not a, you, I, when I'm like that, I have absolute inability to see a glass of water half full. It's always half empty. Always half empty. Tradition number six. 
think I got off on a rant. Oh, jeez. There's quite a few of us up here. Um, An AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise, lest problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. And that's, isn't that what diverts us? And I think that if, if they would add one thing, I would put relationships. <laughs> money, property, prestige, and relationships will divert us from our primary purpose. And those are all the things that give a guy, if, if lack of power is really my dilemma, all those things are the things that so easily can give me an illusion of power and validation that to shore up my life. Money, property, prestige. If I get enough prestige, if I get enough people thinking I'm okay, maybe I'll feel okay. It doesn't work that way. It's an inside job. If I get enough money, maybe I won't be insecure. You know how much money I need? Just enough so I don't have to trust God. You know how much that is? Five dollars more than you'll ever have. I'm telling you. You never get there. You never get there. Money, property, prestige. Divert us from our primary purpose. In the the long form, it it uses a different word. It says problems of money, property, and authority may easily divert us from our primary spiritual aim. We think, therefore, that any considerable property of genuine use to AA should be separately incorporated and managed, thus dividing the material from the spiritual. An AA group as such should never go into business. Uh, my home group, we, we, and I was one of the idiots that thought it was a good idea. to. We started to, to raise money for an event we wanted to put on. We were doing raffles, and, we were, and, and one of the guys went out into the community, knew some friends who were in business, and got them to donate stuff that we would, you know, raffle off. And, oh, my God, and we didn't know any better. But all it takes is one little minority voice, you know, that says, what the hell are you doing? And we all had to take our own inventory and realize, you know, we shouldn't be taking outside contributions. Now, that's not self-supporting. And, and going into business to, produce, to make money, that's a bad deal for an AA group. Secondary aids to AA, such as clubs or hospitals, which require much property or administration, ought to be incorporated and so set apart that, if necessary, they can be freely discarded by the groups. Hence, such facilities ought not to use the AA name. Their management should be the sole responsibility of those people who financially support them. For clubs, AA managers are usually preferred. In the community I live in, in Las Vegas, we are very club heavy. We have probably 15 or more clubs. And some of those clubs are, are non-profit with a board of directors, and some of them have been started by guys that had a little money when they were new and they thought they could support themselves. Uh, they put pinball machines, and they, it's for profit. And what, what often happens in my community is new people will go to their first meeting at one of those clubs and they think that that's AA. They never go anywhere else because they get a little comfort zone going on at that particular club. There was a club in Las Vegas called the Kiss Club and there were people who went solely there. They thought that was Alcoholics Anonymous. They thought by paying dues at that club they were supporting AA. And when that club, it was a for-profit club run by a guy who... Uh, supported himself and his gambling habit through that club. When it when it closed, there were there were some people at that club that they they to them Alcoholics Anonymous ceased to exist because they could never they never differentiated what they never could see past the building to what the heart of an AA group is. It's a it's a spirit that happens when we come together. And if you don't think that. Walk into your home group when no one's there and look at the room. It ain't there. It only happens when we come together. And the group has nothing to do with a building, a club, a facility. It is is the joint heart of its members. Very, very important. I I was one of the guys that I thought AA was, I I thought they were the same thing, the clubs in AA, for when I first got sober. 
But hospitals, as well as other places of recuperation, ought to be well outside AA and medically supervised. While an AA group may cooperate with anyone, such, op- such cooperation ought never go so far as affiliation or endorsement, actual or implied. An AA group can bind itself to no one. I tell you a mistake that we made in my home group, and we made it with good intentions. We did a thing for years at Christmas time where a bunch of us would get together and we'd either go out and, you know, do stuff for the homeless or we'd, you know, stuff like that. And one year, one of our members came up with a list of families with, a, with lots of children that were down and out. And just, matter of fact, they would be homeless except this one organization, Catholic Charities, had, had provided them with a place to live for a short period of time to get them through the holidays. And they had they came up with this list from Catholic charities of these families and all, everything that they needed. You know, we got we went out, we got them turkeys and toys, we had Barbie dolls for the little girl, everything that was on the list. And we made that part of our group, and we would announce it from uh, the podium as a as a group announcement that we're going to be all doing this and we're ta- pa- passing an extra basket, etc. And w- we didn't do that with malice. We did it out of ignorance. We never, we never, we once stepped away from the situation and asked ourselves, does this look? Isn't that funny that it says it that, that way? And yet, I, you know what the first, when I got sober, you know what the, the first job I, that occurred to me I'd like to do? I want to be a paid alcoholism counselor. Because you told me i got to make money. And I got to help people. So I, being self-centered, I connect those dots real quick. Oh, like the counselor, great. <laughs> and I worked my first year of sobriety as a counselor, and my sponsor was on my back about that all the time. And I, I, I was, I wouldn't listen to him. I said, "Oh, it's a great job. I'm, I'm helping people." He said, "You're getting paid for it." No, I'm really helping. You're getting paid for it. And what I, what happened to me was hideous. I started. To, because I did it 10 hours a day when I got off work, I didn't want to do 12-step work. And people would say, why don't you go on this 12-step call? Why don't you come over to the hospital? Oh, I did that all day long. I'm telling you, if you get paid for it, it's not the same thing. And then I became less and less sponsorable because I, I, started, I got some credentials and I became a professional. And you know how, the, I don't know about you guys, but I got that kind of ego. Don't give me credentials. And I think I know something. You know what I mean? And I started being perfect. And then I start, the only time I call my sponsor is to kind of straighten him out. You know, just, because he really didn't, he didn't see all the nuances of this thing. Like I could see him very clearly now. And, and what happened is, is I'm cutting off both ends. I'm cutting off the flow that should be coming in from the old timers. Because I'm a professional, because I'm the know-it-all guy, I'm the I-know guy, and I'm cutting it off the other end where I should be giving them my time and giving it away. I was up in the Rocky Mountains years ago, and I, I saw this lake that was so clean and clear, you could see the rocks on the bottom of the lake. And it was so crystal clear, because on the one side of the lake there's a stream with water rushing in, and on the other side of the lake was a stream with water rushing out, and it could never get stagnant. And when I fell into that trap, I'm cutting off both ends. I got nothing coming in because I'm the great I am. And I got nothing going out because I do that for work all day long. And I'll tell you, God really did something for me. He, he, he got, he, I lost that job and could not get another job in that field and went on into the business that I ended up owning and selling about a year ago. And I don't know that I would have survived it. And yet there are there are members of Alcoholics Anonymous that are wired a little differently than I am that have been able to work in that field as a two hatter and do it successfully for years. One of my one of my close friends, a guy named Keith L has done it for thirty years. But I'll tell you about Keith. I know Keith's sponsor really well. He's very sponsorable. He does everything his sponsor tells him to do. And he doesn't matter if he does that twelve hours during the day, he will get off work and go to a meeting in a hospital or institution and go on a twelve step call. And because of that he's been able to do that. But I it almost killed me. And isn't there you know, I read in a magazine 15, 20 years ago that the, of all the professions, 
a recovering alcoholic could get into. The highest relapse rate was alcoholism counselor. <laughs> Statistically, you have a better shot of staying sober as a drug dealer than as an alcoholism counselor. <laughs> but but it doesn't, isn't that, doesn't that make sense? Because what's the first thing a newcomer wants to be? An alcoholism counselor. And, and get in a relationship. Um, <laughs> Our usual AA 12-step work is never to be paid for. I think I must, I must never take a taker's position in fulfilling my primary purpose. I think it's a dangerous thing. I think, there's a thing that has occurred. I don't know if it's up in this area as much, but it's, in, it's big in Southern California and really big in Nevada. These guys get sober. They're sober about two years. They're able to get a loan. They buy some old house, and then they put, fill it up with new guys with dollar bill signs in their eyes. Going to get rich. And I've seen a couple guys start those houses and they drink again. And, and it's, I think it's a bad deal for us to take a taker's position towards helping people. It's, I think it's dangerous. I think it should always be coming this way. It should never be coming this way. And isn't it funny that the more you push it this way, you turn around and the more you got it just happens like that in God's universe. There's a, it, 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 logically, I'm telling you, it doesn't make any sense, but this is my experience. The more I give, the more I get. That has really been true for me in the realm of the Spirit. Tradition number nine. AA as such ought never be organized. This, I don't see a lot of danger of us breaking this one. I really, I, you know. <laughs> I, the only time I've ever seen us get over organized is there's an Al Anon in there somewhere, you know? <laughs> right? I'm really. I, I mean, have you ever tried to organize a bunch of guys in your home group that do something? It's like herding cats. It's, it's you know, if you're, oh, man. <sighs> It'll give you a headache. You try. We try to do a couple of events every year, or or just a little thing like, where do you want to go eat after the meeting? Oh my God! <laughs> Where's an Al-Anon now that we really need one? <laughs> you know? <laughs> We're good. <laughs> Seeing somebody that come in there and just say, "Go on, go on here." <laughs> oh man. Really, I don't think we're in danger of that. Uh, tradition number ten: alcoholics. And, this this is the tradition that I fall the most short on myself. I really wish I could do better with this one. It says Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues; hence, the AA name ought never be drawn into public controversy. I've learned over the years. To do, I do better with it, with outside controversy than I used to. I, I, I don't know why. I'm such an opinionated guy. I, I get, I'm opinionated about stuff I don't even know anything about. <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't know what that's about. It's crazy. I think that's the way I try to run the universe up in here, figuring it all out and judgments and all that stuff. And there's a, there's a treatment, there's a detox. In Las Vegas, my home group takes four meetings a week into, and they're affiliated with a long-term treatment center that has no AA. They have one meeting a week, but their their real thing is behavior modification. So often at the meetings in the detox, these new guys will come up to me and they'll ask my opinion about going up to this other place. And I used to tell them, and I had to stop because I don't want to. I could hurt Alcoholics Anonymous's relationship with that institution by by show, giving my opinion of something they're affiliated with. That's I have no right to jeopardize a doing that. So now I just go oh, because <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of opinions about what they do, and that I never I don't see anybody that ever comes out of there and stays sober. So I've learned little tricks to sidestep it without expressing my opinion. A guy said, what do you think I should go up there? And I said, well, have you tried it, have you anything else? And he'll say, no, that's the only place I have thought of. And I said, well, why don't you, instead of just putting all your eggs, why don't you look around a couple places, see what's available. And I said, you know, 
be nice if you could go somewhere where you could get to a meeting every day. You know, but I'm not, I don't know, I don't have an opinion on their places. <laughs> I always, I always get a little twitch in my neck when I say that. <laughs> because I do have an opinion on it. I got a strong opinion. Oh. And I have, a, I have opinions about stuff that... Oh, God. I, oh, I don't even want to start. Jesus. <laughs> You know, I, I think that's the source of my unsurrenderedness, is my opinions. You know, really. You know, when you think about it, really, if, if my goal is to, turn, to carry out that decision in step three, and to turn my will first of all, and then my life, my will is really my judgments of everything. I went to an attorney years ago, and I was doing a will, and he says, you know, he told me, he said, blew my mind. He says, you know, your last will is really your last judgment. You're judging these people to be idiots. They get nothing. You're judging these people to be good. And is it that really my will is my judge, it's my opinions, my, my perception, my judgment. And you can measure my degree of unsurrenderedness by the amount of judgments and opinions in my life. You know what I'm really the worst is I'm when I'm the guy who knows everything. You know? When I'm at my very best is I'm, I'm almost, I, and I, this doesn't happen that often, but if I can get surrendered enough to almost be like a child who doesn't know anything. I, I struggle the most with this. When I, usually when I'm in a state of conflict or resentment or anxiety, it's because I've made a judgment or opinion about life that has put me in conflict with the flow and it's my futile effort to try to control things you know because I'm scared my you can measure my uh, amount of self-centered fear by my amount of judgments well that's that's it for my 10th step for today uh, <clears throat> 11 <laughs> we're almost done our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion we need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. At the level of press, radio, and films. Did you notice that when I got up here, I introduced myself and I gave my last name. My name is Bob, and I'm an alcoholic. And my phone number is in the book. And if you ever find yourself on the streets of Alcoholics Anonymous, drunk or sober, and you need help, you may call me. I... I didn't always give my last name in Alcoholics Anonymous because I got sober at a, at a club where people only gave their first name. Matter of fact, the first time I heard somebody give their last name, I was expecting the tradition police to run in and put cuffs on him. And it was, I wanted to tell him, you gave your last name. And then I got in, in, when I was about a little over a year, a year and a half sober, I got involved in general service. And I started going to the crosses and the forums and all that stuff. And I started attending these workshops on the traditions and the concepts that were put on these panels, often by people sober, very long time, trustees, delegates, area officers from different parts of the country. And I was at a meeting, a uh, panel, and the anonymity was the, uh, the subject. And everyone on the panel spoke eloquent, eloquently on the subject of anonymity and really opened my eyes. And the one guy on the pa panel was a past... Uh, I think it, maybe a trustee or delegate, I'm not sure. But he talked about a thing that Dr. Bob said, that I, a portion of it is repeated in Dr. Bob and the good old timers, where he felt that it was that the level of anonymity is set exactly at the public level. It's, and it's just as much of a breach of the tradition to withhold myself, in my name and and who I am within the fellowship, below the public level, as it is to go public and tell everybody I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous with my first, na first and last name. That it's said exactly. And my, uh, I have this one friend of mine used to say that we were in danger of becoming a secret society within an anonymous organization. That, that and in the spirit of anonymity was never designed to withhold myself and distance myself from other alcoholics that I might be able to be helpful to. It's, it's designed to protect me from me from distinguishing myself 
away from you by being something publicly special. Right? And so I try to give my name. I get, I've started trying to give my name, and I always give my name within the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. But I will never break my anonymity at a public level. And I've, I've had situations arise. Years ago, <clears throat> probably mid, mid-90s, I had gotten a lot of notoriety in my community. Uh, I owned a business that we were pretty much the top of the food chain. And what we were is we were a chain of liquor stores. Uh, sort of like the old Trader Joe's with all the wines and all. And then we had the food and stuff too. And somebody in the media got wind. And I don't know if somebody in AA told them or what. That this guy who runs the largest chain of liquor stores in the in Nevada used to be a wino that lived on the streets and was an alcoholic. And they thought, this is a great story. You know, this is all. And they came to me and they wanted to do a piece on this. And I said, absolutely not. You, you want to kill me? You want me to be the special guy? The famous guy? I've watched people break the movie stars and stuff, break their anonymity and sports stars at the public level. I've never seen any good come from it. You know what it seems like they're almost saying? That I'm so important that I'm going to bring up, by telling everybody I'm an AA, I'm going to bring up the credibility of AA. All right? And a lot of those guys get drunk again because they separate themselves from the herd. They're no longer just another member of Alcoholics Anonymous. They're a famous member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'll tell you, I don't see any, I, I don't see anything different from being special better or being special worse. You're separate in both cases. Whether you're sep- better, special better or special worse. And I, it's, my life depends upon me being unified to you. I must be part of this. My personal recovery depends upon AA unity. I was, God's grace gave me a seat in Alcoholics Anonymous, a chance to be a part of you, and I must do everything I can to be one of you. If I ever separate myself, special worse or special better, I am, I'm in a lot of trouble here, but I'm not one of the herd. So per, we always maintain it, personal anonymity, at the level of press, radio, and film. You know, I'll t- tell you something else that I've thought about a lot in the last couple of years. There, there are a few tapers around the country that have websites, and they take talks of AA speakers from AA meetings and put them on the Internet where anybody can go and download it. The problem with that is is that most AA speakers, if you listen to AA tapes, give their last name within the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, my first, I found a guy called me from Texas. He heard, heard my, got me off the Internet. He, and he knew my name and everything. He was able to call me, which is fine. He's a member of AA. That's cool. But is that public level? I don't know. I think the con- that's something I, I feel the conference needs to address. Is the Internet public level? These guys that are putting our names up as as AA members, first and last names, is that a breach of the tradition? I don't know. I've heard arguments on both sides. I've heard people say, well, no, it's not really public level, it's destination level, like going to a meeting, because you're going to a particular website. There's that argument, and then I've had other people say, yeah, but anybody can just go there. You can just, you could be trying to track somebody down and, and just be looking at all different websites, and you could find, just find them. So I don't know. I don't know. Maybe the conference will so, will solve that problem one day. And tradition number 12. Anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. What was your opinion on that? I'll get, I'll get to that. I'm getting to it. You know what I thought for a lot of years? I thought that what they meant in order to stay here, is that I had to put the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous ahead of your screwed up personality so I could tolerate you. Right? I, I knew that pathetic. That's what I, I thought that for a long time. And you know, what I, you know what I realized after a lot of years here? 
There's only one personality I got to contend with here, and that's me. I am the source of my all judgment, separation, and conflict. It is the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous that I must put before my personality. That if I am really to stay here and claim my seat in Alcoholics Anonymous and maintain it, I must come here and lose myself. And come here and be a servant. And come here to be helpful. I think one of the most dangerous things that sometimes we do in Alcoholics Anonymous is to get up to a podium like this. It is, it's a dangerous thing because it separates. I don't, I'll tell you something, I don't want to be speaker Bob. That's a dangerous thing for me. And I have a sponsor who probably does this more than anything, and he keeps me humble. And in order to do this, I'm, I must be on skid row three times a week. I sponsor guys. I hear fifth steps. I answer the phone, and I go on 12-step calls. I pick up chairs at my home group. I do all of that stuff. And I must do that stuff. I know guys, I have some friends in AA that have backed away on all that stuff and all they do is get up here. I'll tell you something, that I think for a guy with like me is could be fatal. Because I will become the special alcoholic. And I'm going to close with reading the, the twelfth tradition in the long form. I think it's one of the most beautiful things ever written in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, when they read these the long form at my home group once a month. It's, I love to watch the room because the newcomers, after about the seventh tradition, are rolling their eyes and just, oh my God. It's like this, they, it's, they have this look on their face like they're enduring the punishment for being a bad drunk, you know. And, and, and when they get to the twelfth tradition, a lot of these people think that the reader interjects the first two words that they're not really written here because you've been reading this for ten minutes and it goes, and finally. <laughs> right. <laughs> and finally, we of Alcoholics Anonymous believe that the principle of anonymity has an immense spiritual significance. It reminds us that we are to place principles before personalities, that we are actually to practice a genuine humility. This to the end, that our great blessings may never spoil us that we shall forever live in thankful contemplation of him who provides over us all. One of the problems with recovery from alcoholism is that recovery in AA has good news and bad news. The good news is you work the steps, you help other drunks, you get a great and abundant life. The bad news is you get a great and abundant life. And it's, it is only the blessings and the fruits of my sobriety are one of the things that can take a guy like me out of here, that can separate me from you. And if I can remain in forever, forever thankful contemplation of the source of everything in my life, he who presides over us all. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.